welcome back to our monthly program of the Laguna Woods Democratic Club. Today, we have a fantastic surprise for you. We have Congressman Mike Levine speaking to us about his work and the problem in general of the environment today and climate change. Before we get started with our main speaker, I want to introduce Jean Lepowski, who's going to give us a brief moment of reflection. Jean? Ruby Bridges was the first child of Lucille and Avon Bridges, who were farmers in Mississippi. The family moved to New Orleans, Louisiana, when Ruby was two. Ruby attended a segregated kindergarten, but then a federal court ordered Louisiana schools to be desegregated. For the first grade, Ruby's parents made the difficult decision to send Ruby, now a first grader, to a nearby all-white school. It was a difficult decision. The benefit of a good education had to be weighed against the very real threat to little Ruby's safety. Ruby and her mother were escorted to and from school every day by four federal marshals during the entire school year. In 1963, as his first assignment for Look Magazine, Norman Rockwell created this famous painting, which he called The Problem We All Live With. It was published in the January 1964 issue of Look Magazine. Note the garbage that was aimed at the little girl, the N-word prominently displayed, and the letters KKK on the left side. Much later, Ruby observed that even though there were mobs outside that school every day for a whole year, the person that greeted me every morning was a white woman who actually risked her life as well. She was referring to her teacher. The painting hangs in the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. This photo shows Lucille Bridges, Ruby's mom, with the painting. In 2011, Barack Obama had set the three by, had the three by five painting hung in a well-trafficked hallway outside the Oval Office. Obama was famously quiet on the subject of race, but the act of hanging the painting was a sharp commentary. Here we see the president and Bridges with the painting. Obama told Bridges, I think it's fair to say that if it hadn't been for you guys, I might not be here and we might not be looking at this together. Nearly 60 years later, little Ruby's bravery continues to influence our nation. Thank you, Jean. And before we go on with the main presentation and I, before I introduce Alan, I want to thank you very much, Congressman Mike Levine, for being here. I want to also thank your campaign manager, Adam Berkowitz, who I hear is a fantastic staffer. I want to thank Pat, our genius computer expert, Alan, Jean, and all of you who are here today and of course, Channel 6 for giving us this opportunity. So Alan, our fantastic and favorite secretary of our club will now introduce Congressman Mike Levin. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you to everybody who is here on our Zoom recording this morning. And thank you to everybody watching us on Drupal's Village TV and on YouTube. Well, as Rebecca said, we are excited this morning to have Congressman Mike Levin as our speaker. Congressman Levin represents the 49th Congressional District, which is in Orange County here in California. And he was first elected in 2018 as part of, and one of the big reasons for the blue wave of that year, and he was reelected in 2020. Today, he's gonna give us an update on the environment and climate issues from his vantage point in Washington. And really, there is nobody who is more knowledgeable or better qualified to speak to us on these issues than Congressman Levin. Mike Levin's a graduate of Stanford University and Duke Law School. When he went into private practice after graduation, he specialized in, in the areas of the environment, climate, and energy. He's been working on these issues for a long time. Before he was in Congress, he was a member of the board of organizations like the Center for Sustained Energy and he helped co-found an organization called Sustain USC, OC, pardon me, Sustain OC, which uh, advocates for the 
quicker transition of our inevitable changeover to more sustainable uh, power and energy sources. Uh, because it's right down the street from us. Many of us are familiar with the work that he's done trying to craft some sort of solution to the seemingly insolvable problem of the uh, decommissioned nuclear power plant at San Onofre and its attendant nuclear waste. And uh, he was also for a while executive director of the Democratic Party of Orange County before he went to Congress. Now, as all members of the House of Representatives pretty much do, Congressman Eleven specializes, concentrates on several areas. One of them is Veterans Affairs. He's a member of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, and he's the chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity, which is a very good segue into another area he specializes in, and that's the area he's gonna to speak to us about today, climate change, the environment, uh, but not just the usual set of things that go around those issues, but also helping to recognize and make sure we can take advantage of the economic opportunities that will come from moving to more sustainable forms of energy. Uh, Congressman uh, Levin is a member of the House Natural, National, Natural, can't spit that one out, House Committee on Natural Resources, and he's also a member of the House Select Committee on Climate Crisis. And in addition to a lot of other caucuses and organizations he belongs to in Congress, he's a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And as the grandchild of Mexican immigrants, he's also a member of the Hispanic Caucus, as I said, many others also. And just before uh, he speaks, I just want to express what Rebecca expressed both to Congressman Levin for taking his time to speak to us today and to Adam Berkowitz and the rest of his staff who did such a Great job making our life easy and making this happen seamlessly. So now I'm going to shut up and uh, we're going to listen to what Congressman Mike Levin has to say to us. Congressman. Well, thank you so much, uh, Alan, for that extremely kind and uh, generous introduction. It's such an honor to be back uh, with the Laguna Woods Democratic Club. As I mentioned to a few folks uh, on the Zoom uh, before we uh, started uh, recording, uh, I uh, remember back to 2006 when I first uh, came to the club. Uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful Democratic club. You should be extremely proud. Uh, and I'm so happy and thrilled to hear that uh, you all are doing quite well during the pandemic. Uh, I know it's been a difficult time for everyone. Uh, I was told that uh, around 90% of uh, everyone in the Green Woods has been vaccinated. That is an extraordinary uh, number, and I'm very, very happy to hear it. Uh, particularly as we see uh, most recently, the, the data suggests that roughly 99% of all the new hospitalizations, deaths, and um, serious illnesses uh, related to COVID since January 1st have been among the unvaccinated. So thank you so much. It's also, it's great to see some familiar names and faces. Uh, there obviously have been uh, many different folks responsible for this great club over the years. Uh, I know at least a few that I, I see on the Zoom uh, names and faces from my time uh, in uh, past years uh, addressing the club, although we didn't have Zoom. When I first addressed the Laguna Woods Democratic Club, Zoom wasn't even a thing. So I hope that uh, in all uh, due course, we'll be able to get together in person one of these days. I'd love to do that very much. Uh, for those that don't know, I uh, grew up in South Orange County. Uh, my family, uh, I, I was born in uh, in LA and, and we moved uh, to uh, South Orange County when I was eight. Uh, spent the first eight years of my life in Long Beach. We moved in, uh, I think, 85 to what was then El Toro, uh, what, what is today uh, Lake Forest. I think it was incorporated in 91 or 92 uh, and uh, been very proud uh, South Orange County resident uh, other than uh, college and law school. Uh, and uh, when I got back from law school, I knew I wanted to get involved in environmental law and in public law as well, and uh, really had a neat opportunity to work in the clean energy sector uh, to uh, look at new and exciting technologies uh, that are helping to accelerate the transition to a more sustainable future. Uh, sorry for the phone. Hopefully that won't happen too often. Uh, and also, I have a seven-year-old and nine-year-old, so if they decide to uh, Zoom bomb us at some point during the proceedings, you are forewarned that that may happen, uh, but they're very cute. I promise you if they uh, if they uh, visit us. Uh, but uh, long story short, I've been very involved in democratic politics for a number of years. Uh, and in the 2016 election, uh, did all I could to help Secretary Clinton uh, and was there in New York City on election night 
uh, when uh, the unthinkable happened and uh, Donald Trump was uh, elected president of the United States, I resolved right then and there that I would not wait for others to uh, make the kind of changes and protect our democracy and deal with climate change and so many other issues that I care about greatly uh, that I needed to do it uh, and I needed to, to take action and uh, not wait for others. So uh, I had to convince my wife that that was a good plan and uh, I had to build a great team uh, like Adam and, and so many others. And uh, shortly thereafter, we were up and running. We had a great race in 2018. We ran in one of the very competitive uh, primaries. Uh, as uh, you know, we have the top two system in California uh, and we had a very, very tough primary. We were very grateful uh, to make it through. We won against Diane Harkey. You might remember Diane Harkey uh, former assembly member, board of equalization member, and mayor of Dana Point. Uh, we won in the general election with a pretty good margin uh, in 2018. Then, of course, in 2020, it was a very unusual election. The pandemic hit, uh, and uh, we couldn't do a lot of the in-person campaigning that we really know. Uh, well, it's the oldest form of campaigning. I would argue it's still the best form of campaigning, the volunteer contact, uh, also the in-person house parties, the in-person town halls. Uh, my pre I should also mention my predecessor was Daryl Issa in this district. You've probably heard of Daryl Issa before. Uh, he wound up running in the neighboring district. So he retired before the 2018 race. He wound up running in the neighboring district after Duncan Hunter Jr. was indicted and convicted and sentenced, eventually was pardoned uh, by Donald Trump, uh, but did not run for re-election. So Issa wound up running in the neighboring seat to the east. Uh, we wound up winning in 2020 by 6%, 6.2% against the former mayor of San Juan Capistrano. And we anticipate a tough 2022 race ahead. And I hope we'll have a chance to speak more about that. But I think 2022 will look a lot more like 2018, uh, both that it will be challenging, but also that we'll have the opportunity to actually get out there and connect uh, voter to voter, door to door, person to person in a way that I think is really powerful and persuasive. Uh, now, perhaps more than ever, uh, to, to get out there and speak with voters. Uh, a lot of the work that we do in Congress is based on the committees in which we serve. And the committees that I serve, uh, as uh, Alan uh, referenced briefly, House Natural Resources Committee, so everything to do with water and oceans and wildlife and energy and mineral resources, that all falls under the jurisdiction of the committee. Uh, one of the efforts I'm very proud of uh, on the committee is uh, an offshore drilling ban uh, that we have introduced for the Southern California coast. Uh, now you might wonder, is that really a threat? And the answer is it could be. So with the last administration uh, sitting down with the then Interior Secretary David Bernhardt, I asked Secretary Bernhardt, uh, is uh, the Trump administration going to listen to the will of Californians? Uh, Democrats, Republicans, and independents alike. And if there are Republicans and independents watching this, you probably don't want to see drill rigs off the California coast either, or at least not more of them, uh, because of the threat that uh, it would have on our regional economy and our environment. And uh, the Trump administration said that they would not commit uh, to following or respecting the will of Californians when it comes to offshore drilling. So we thought it very important. Well, I'm not at all worried about the Biden administration. I am worried about future administrations and the desire to drill off the California coast. So we're gonna stand up strong on that. And uh, we introduced our legislation uh, just about a month and a half ago. We're gonna be getting it through the house. I hope we get it through the Senate on the president's desk. I think that would be a huge victory. Uh, my district is a coastal district. So this is a very personal issue uh, for me. And as we all enjoy our beautiful coastal environment, I think for all of us, uh, and the district, I should also mention to you, the district includes all of South Orange County. Uh, so it starts just south of you. And Dana Point has Dana Point, uh, Rancho Mission Viejo, uh, Rancho Santa Margarita, part of Rancho Santa Margarita, uh, all of um, San Juan Capistrano, where I live, all of San Clemente, other beautiful unincorporated areas like Ladera Ranch. So basically, I'm right on the border with you. And of course, you never know in redistricting. I can wind up as your member of Congress, or maybe not. Who knows? Anybody that says they know, they have no idea. Uh, we're all just sort of waiting to see what the uh, Independent uh, Commission will do with regard to district lines. Um, the other committees that I serve, as uh, Alan mentioned, the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Uh, that is a really important group of people. I was really honored to be picked by Speaker Pelosi to serve on that committee as one of three 
uh, freshmen, members of the uh, committee, uh, great honor. And, and what we did in the last Congress is we put together a bold and comprehensive plan of action uh, that you can actually go and check out if you have the time. Uh, it's uh, climate crisis, one word, climatecrisis.house.gov. And you can see our action plan. And uh, there's an executive summary if you don't feel like reading all 500 pages. But what we did is as follows. We addressed it from a scientific perspective. We all know the statistics are daunting. We all see it, experience it. We know the recent extreme weather in the Pacific Northwest is one of many examples or the drought that we're now experiencing or the wildfires that we see, the sea level rise that we uh, experience. All of it we know is related to climate change. We know it's uh, at least in part uh, caused by humans and it's only going to get worse as we continue to emit uh, more greenhouse gases. And so the, the science uh, suggests that we need bold and comprehensive action to reduce our carbon footprint from a wide variety of sources. Uh, sometimes I'm asked, what do we need to do exactly? Do we all need to go out and uh, lessen our individual carbon footprint by uh, getting a zero emission vehicle? Or do we need to rely more on public transportation? Or do we need to build more energy efficient uh, residential and commercial buildings? Uh, do we need to have a lower carbon power generation where we re rely on more renewable uh, sources of electricity, solar and wind? And do we need more storage, uh, utility scale storage from batteries and from other sources? Do we need to have more sustainable agriculture where we actually uh, are using regenerative agriculture and, and reducing our carbon footprint from the food that we eat? And of course, the answer to all these things is yes, we have to do all these things and we have to do them all to whatever extent we can and we need a broad federal government uh, response. We need uh, a, uh, a real, uh, we, have to, we have to be in a position of global leadership again on this issue. We have to be thinking about the climate crisis uh, through the lens of followership. And what I mean by followership is what are the actions that we can take as the United States where we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions enough where the solutions are actually commensurate with the science and what are those steps that we can take where the rest of the world will follow, where we're not just going it alone? Uh, so the select committee set out to do that. And they put together, we put together a very comprehensive plan that'll get us about 85% of the way to where we need to be. Uh, now that's both encouraging and also scary because it's a very comprehensive plan and it only gets us to 85% of the way that we need to be. But I encourage you to check it out and it's all things that we could and should do. And in fact, we've already started to do with the Biden administration, reversing some of the more onerous executive actions under the Trump administration. You probably are aware that the Trump administration uh, was not pro-environment, uh, that they were not often pro-science. I would go a step further. I believe the Trump administration to be the most anti-environment administration in the modern history of the United States. Uh, let's not forget the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. They were not, bi they were not partisan uh, in nature. They were bipartisan in nature when they were originally uh, introduced and signed into law. The president at the time, do you all know who the president was when the EPA was created? Anyone? Anyone? Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, good Californian, was the president at the time. And he was no champion of the environment, in my opinion. But back then, in the 70s versus today, uh, the polarization of our politics, the politicization of things like clean air and clean water and climate, it's gotten far, far worse, far more um, you know, uh, partisan in nature than it ever was before. Uh, just the same, take it a step further. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, we dealt with acid rain as a country. Uh, and we made amendments uh, to uh, uh, EPA regulations. And George H.W. Bush was president at the time. Fast forward to uh, mid 2000s in California where uh, we got very aggressive around uh, air quality standards and we created a cap and trade program in California, a low carbon fuel standard in California, who was governor when a lot of those things were created. Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger, again, a Republican, and when California, here's a, a good piece of history. California, as you probably know, if you grew up in California, as I did, 
with the era of smugglers. Everybody remembers the smugglers. When I went outside in South Orange County in the 1980s, often air quality would not be so great. And we cleaned up our act big time. And one of the, the uh, mechanisms that we use is a waiver from the Federal Clean Air Act that we got way back before the Federal Clean, when, when the Federal Clean Air Act was uh, signed into law, we wanted to go further to reduce tailpipe emissions because of the overwhelming challenges we'd had in California with smog, with particulate matter and NOx and the other criteria air pollutants. The governor at the time, when we got that waiver, was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, again, no great champion of the environment. But I bring all that up because around the time that Donald Trump became president, something fundamentally changed. And I don't think it was just Donald Trump. I think it was also the campaign finance system. The campaign finance system after the Citizens United decision, which was a horribly decided Supreme Court opinion, uh, gave carte blanche to big polluters to funnel money to uh, their favorite politicians. And if you want to really understand, so we think about all these challenges that we're facing. We, we think about all the things that we need to do to solve these challenges with regard to climate. Why is it that when 70 or 80% of the American people want us to solve these problems, why is it that Congress cannot find a way to act? And I would offer to you the biggest reason is because too many politicians of both parties, of both parties are having their pockets lined by big oil, by fossil fuel, by coal, by natural gas, all of them with the intent of stifling whatever progress we want to make. And I'll let you Google all of that. You can see some of the more recent things have been written about Exxon and other uh, companies with regard to their political involvement. But let me just tell you, it ain't a pretty picture and it is a big problem, which is why we need fundamental campaign finance reform on top of everything else. I think it's the key that will unlock a lot of uh, necessary action. Now, the president's gonna go forward and do a lot on climate. And one of the big things that's happening right now is the new American Jobs Plan. Hopefully you've heard about this American Jobs Plan. Uh, massive infrastructure investment, the biggest that we've had since the days of Franklin Roosevelt. Our infrastructure needs all the help it can get. It is currently, depending on uh, the report you read, the American Society of Civil Engineers gives us about a C or a D, uh, depending on the state that you're looking at. Others uh, have been even less kind than that. But we need to get our infrastructure back to uh, a, uh, an A. I, I want to make sure that we're uh, doing everything we can as we fight for that infrastructure framework to act on climate, to make sure that we're providing the proper incentives, the proper structure uh, to ensure that we are, in fact, accelerating that transition to sustainability. So I recently led a letter of 130 of my fellow Democrats across the ideological spectrum from the very progressive to the more moderate and conservative, reminding the president of our fundamental principles around climate action and the things that we wanna see. Everything from 100% renewables, 100% zero emission vehicles for new car sales in, in a, a short period of time. Uh, we wanna see uh, equity as all of this is uh, moving forward. We wanna make sure that we're keeping in mind environmental justice, social justice uh, as well. So I'm encouraged, I'm excited at the opportunity uh, that this administration uh, is providing us to get this done. We've got to get it through, obviously, the Senate. If you've got any friends in West Virginia or Arizona, you might want to encourage them to nudge their senators, Senator Manchin, Senator Sinema, to go along with a uh, reconciliation vehicle around climate and around some other priorities that we have, in addition to the bipartisan infrastructure framework that we know that they uh, support. Um, I, I'll talk for just a minute or two about a couple of other local environmental issues. You brought up San Onofre. We could have an entire meeting and uh, just discuss San Onofre and the challenges around spent nuclear fuel in the United States. The bottom line is this, we have nowhere to send the waste. So the waste itself at San Onofre sitting there on the coast, well, that's a problem, a big problem. It's really just the symptom. The symptom is we have nowhere to send that waste, nowhere to send any of the nation's commercial spent nuclear fuel. And we have to develop uh, solutions and that's what we're trying to do. When I was elected in 2019, we created a task force headed by the former head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and co-chaired by a retired Navy Admiral 
Uh, you can read our report. Uh, maybe Adam can circulate uh, the link. It has all sorts of technical information, but most importantly, it has eight specific recommendations for the federal government, things the federal government needs to do, and we have already acted and are acting on all eight of them. Uh, just a couple that I'll mention. One uh, is to have legislation that will say for all of the nation's nuclear fuel, uh, nuclear waste from all the commercial plants, move waste first from those facilities that have the highest seismic risk and the highest population uh, density within 50 miles of the, uh, the reactor site. Now, we win. We, I, I don't know if I want to win on those uh, two things, but we win at San Onofre because we, basically we've got 9 million of all of us within 50 miles of San Onofre, both in Orange and San Diego counties. And we've also got a significant earthquake risk. In fact, uh, you, before they built the plant there, that area was called Earthquake Bay, probably not the greatest place to build a commercial nuclear power plant, but it is what it is. Uh, we also have rising sea levels that are of great concern to me. What is happening right now is the plant is in the process of being decommissioned. The domes, the, the, uh, the famous domes everyone knows as they drive down to the five freeway, those are being uh, taken apart as we speak. I was just there and I saw what they're doing. They have to be very careful about it. And they can take them all apart. They can take out the uh, components, pretty much everything other than the, uh, the fuel itself, the, the big fuel rods itself can be moved. They can uh, send it off as lower level waste uh, to a site in Utah. And that's what they're doing. They have a, a rail line that literally goes right up to those domes. They're loading rail cars. They're moving uh, pretty much everything other than the waste the actual nuclear uh, uh, rods themselves uh, to Utah. Now, what to do with the rods themselves? There are about 130 canisters that will be filled when all is said and done with this nuclear fuel with nowhere to send it. So we need somewhere to send it permanently, not just for San Onofre, but all across the country. Um, we don't have that today. We invested in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, $16 billion of taxpayer money in Yucca Mountain in Nevada. You've heard of Yucca Mountain in Nevada? We have not moved a single fuel rod to Yucca Mountain and we won't, and we won't anytime soon. The Biden administration doesn't wanna do it. The Trump administration didn't wanna do it. The Obama administration didn't wanna do it. And this all started when Harry Reid was the majority leader of the United States Senate. And I guarantee you that uh, my colleagues from Nevada do not want the waste moved to Nevada. I know because I talk to them all the time about it. I've been there. There are potentially some legitimate uh, technical concerns around geology, around groundwater. And, um, but the reality is we invested a whole lot of time and money with no plan B, there was no plan B. So we've got to work on a plan B and that's what we're trying to do. And we're going to need everyone's help and support in the coming months, the coming years. It's a problem that was not created overnight it took tens of years for us to get where we are today. It's going to take time for us to fix this problem, to create that repository, to look at things like interim storage while we're developing that repository. The key is my objective will remain, has been from day one of my service will remain as long as I have the honor to serve, to get that waste off our coast as quickly and as safely uh, as we can. Uh, so we're working on a lot of other local environmental issues as well. Bluff erosion, bluff collapses, coastal erosion, huge problem in our district. Water quality is always a concern of mine. Plastic pollution is a big concern of mine. And I'm really honored to get the opportunity to serve uh, as uh, all the committees of jurisdiction do their work. I'm really honored to be right in the thick of things. As Alan mentioned, I'll close with this. I also serve on the Veterans Affairs Committee. I chair one of the subcommittees responsible for veteran employment, veteran housing. Uh, veteran transition into civilian life, uh, veteran homelessness. And I also serve on the Veterans Health Subcommittee as well. And so I thank all of our veterans. Usually if we were in a room together, I would ask the veterans to raise their hand and then ask for applause. We will have to do that virtually today. Uh, so if you are a veteran, I thank you uh, for all that you have done to defend and honor our country. Uh, my grandfather was a World War II veteran. Uh, I miss him very much, uh, and I think about him every single day when I think about uh, our men and women in service today and that legacy that he left and what he would want to see uh, 
I know he'd want his youngest grandson fighting like crazy for that democracy that he fought for uh, when he went overseas in World War II. So with that, I'm very grateful. Uh, obviously, we would love your help and support for the campaign moving forward. Uh, we're going to need all the help we can get. Uh, and uh, with that, I will turn it over back to Alan or, or back to Rebecca. Uh, and happy to have uh, a Q&A with uh, the time that we have left and look forward to seeing you all in person soon. I'll, t I'll take it. Uh, this is Alan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman Levin. We really appreciate your remarks. And we appreciate very much the work that you do on these issues for us in Washington. Uh, so we do have, uh, we do, as you might imagine, we do have some questions. And uh, I'm going to uh, j just start with a, a, a kind of a simple one. Uh, it concerns the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus uh, in Washington. Uh, is that something you belong to now, and is it something you would consider joining? And uh, you know, if yes or if no, why? What are the reasons? What would be your reasons? Well, the caucus is somewhat dormant. That bipartisan climate solutions caucus. It was designed to push uh, some specific legislation, which is good legislation, which I've co-sponsored. Um, it had, to my knowledge, that that climate solutions caucus isn't actively meeting. Uh, the people that are meeting are the groups that I'm involved in. Uh, if, and if the Climate Solutions Caucus starts to meet up, I'll be happy to join them as well. Uh, but the real action is happening on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis that I serve on, on something called SEEK, the uh, 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 it's uh, Sustainable Environment and Energy Caucus, I believe is what that stands for. That meets quite often. Uh, and then the Republicans now have a Climate Caucus as well. Uh, I am all for Republicans coming to the table with viable solutions once they acknowledge the threat that exists, once they acknowledge the science uh, and accept the science. Some people say, well, I believe in climate change. It's nothing to believe in. You either accept the data, accept the science for, for the fact, for the objective fact that it presents and, and you deal with it, or you don't. And so we have some Republicans, and I'm actually encouraged that my friend John Curtis of Utah, former mayor of Provo, he's a very conservative guy, but he's a, he's a friend and he's a reasonable guy. Uh, I think he wants to fix uh, some of the misinformation uh, in his party. Uh, but the reality is, is uh, you know, I would love to work on a bipartisan basis on these issues. In fact, I have uh, done more on a bipartisan basis with regard to environmental policy than I ever thought I would uh, in Congress. And uh, I think there's a, a great deal uh, of room to grow there if the Republican Party um, actually adheres to science as opposed to fiction. Yeah, this is a, uh, I guess this is a related question, some of which you touched on in your answer to this, but uh, one of our, uh, one of the people on the Zoom who's a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby wants, first yeah. of all, thank you for yep. co-sponsoring the uh, Car Innovations in Carbon Dividend Act 2021. Um, and their, their question is, what, which you've touched on, what do you think the, the chances are of getting Republican support for this, for this specific uh, act? And uh, I mean, how do you go about doing that? Uh, it's, uh, you know, you get it's to see the- easy. Yeah, it's not easy. And, and whoever uh, on the Zoom is uh, part of CCL, I'm very grateful for your activism. I was on with um, uh, CCL not long ago and actually had lunch yesterday with the group in San Juan Capistrano uh, one of the uh, folks there was Larry Kramer, who does a lot with the South Orange County chapter of CCL, former uh, San Juan city councilman and uh, worked on uh, nuclear submarines for the Navy. Very smart guy. And, you know, I, I firmly believe that we need some sort of carbon pricing, whether it's the, the fee and dividend mechanism uh, that uh, CCL has championed or, or whether it's something similar. I know a former Congressman uh, Inglis was a big leader on this and is a big leader on this. Um, my hope is that we can try to get some sort of carbon trading mechanism, uh, uh, clean energy standards, something big and bold uh, in the reconciliation vehicle. Um, Evergreen Action is a great organization that uh, put together a white paper explaining why a clean energy standard could actually fit uh, reconciliation. Now, let me take a step back. If you, if you have not heard of reconciliation, I will briefly explain that 
we can get around the filibuster. The filibuster requires that you have 60 votes in the Senate. And I think that needs to be reformed. But uh, again, Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema, a handful of others do not agree. So how do we then move forward with legislation that doesn't require the 60 votes? And you can do it via a process called budget reconciliation. Uh, the good part with that is that you only need 50 votes plus Vice President Harris uh, to, uh, to pass legislation. That's what we did with the American Rescue Plan for COVID. The downside is that reconciliation does not allow for anything that is not directly relevant to the budget. So think of revenue, think of taxation, it's gotta be directly re related to, to that. So as an example, in the American Rescue Plan, we wanted to have a $15 living wage, which is also long overdue. And the Senate parliamentarian decided, you know what, that doesn't fit. It's more of a policy decision, less of a budget, less of a revenue, less of a taxation uh, measure. The same could happen with some of the uh, provisions that we'd like to see you know, in, in climate legislation or in healthcare legislation, you name it. But um, what I know is happening right now is that we're moving forward on two tracks. The first track is on this bipartisan infrastructure framework, which is now supported by 22 senators and counting, 11 Republicans, 11 Democrats that came together and negotiated this framework. Uh, it's a good framework. I just don't think it goes far enough in certain ways. Uh, what's in it is good. Roads, bridges, broadband, all of that is important. Water, all of it is important. But it doesn't include key, uh, some key climate uh, provisions that I think are necessary. So then you look at uh, reconciliation and doing another bill. And that's what we're doing as well. We're, uh, Bernie Sanders and John Yermuth are the chairs of the budget committees, respectively, in the Senate and in the House. They're working on a budget resolution that will set a top line number, and then we will backfill policy into that top line number. That's exactly what we did with the American Rescue Plan. And so all of this is going to happen. It's exciting. Buckle your seatbelts for the next few months in Washington. It's going to be fun. And I hope that we'll look back and we'll be, be very proud about what we were able to accomplish. And I hope that uh, some sort of carbon trading mechanism is included in all of that, Alan. Okay, thank you. And by the way, that question was from Ann Beltran. She's the member of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. So thank you, Ann. Give her and credit. Alan, credit Alan, is Alan, due. Time, if, if CCL has a, an active membership in West Virginia or Arizona, now is a good time for them to speak uh, up. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, well, what I wanted to ask you to, about, the uh, next question is about an uh, a kind of long range planning. I mean, we just see the problems that we have getting people to people countries to agree to cut down their uh, greenhouse emissions and uh, uh, to a level that's sustainable right now. Uh, so is there any, is it possible even to do any long-term planning on uh, uh, what we can do to keep, to, to manage these things in, in the long run rather than just in the short run, trying to get people to you know, cut down their greenhouse emissions. Yes, so the good news, Alan, is that we, we have already done quite a bit of that planning. Uh, thanks to the Obama administration, we entered into the Paris Climate Agreement uh, that set pretty good standards for the world uh, you know, with uh, our own uh, national determined contributions. And of course, President Obama uh, led and got the rest of the world on board, including China. They were not so excited about this at first, but uh, he got pretty much every industrialized nation in the world, and, and uh, it was a huge accomplishment. And then, of course, President Trump, because he thought everything Obama did was wrong, uh, immediately said, we're going to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. But um, with the caveat being that if uh, we won the election in 2020, we would get right back in as if uh, we never left and you know knock wood that's exactly what happened so i even have a button somewhere that says we're back in and so we are back in and i was uh in so the un uh, helps uh shepherd a lot of this work uh that's where the the paris agreement uh back in 2015 you know in, in paris uh, as part of the un climate conference they call it the cop uh we, and i went to the cop last year in madrid uh, or 2019, they, they delayed it, obviously with the pandemic, they couldn't do it. But 2019, uh, I went and it was really sad because um, all the other industrialized nations of the world were still fighting to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. 
except the United States did not really have a big presence there, uh, other than to try to export natural gas to the developing world. And uh, so we were trying to um, actually promote fossil fuels. I say we, the Trump administration. So I was there with the speaker. I was there with a congressional delegation, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and, and a number of my colleagues in Congress uh, saying, hey, wait, the Trump administration does not speak for us all. And if we win in 2020, we're gonna be right back here leading the way again. So I'll be very excited. I get to go back in November to Scotland, to the COP26 in Glasgow, and we're back. We're, we, and we have to do things, as I said at the outset, Alan, it's got to be about followership. So if we do things in a vacuum, if we reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, but we don't take steps to do so in a way that is not only environmentally the right thing to do, but economically the right thing to do, it, I, my, my uh, belief is that if we do these things that we set out, they will be huge from an economic perspective. Because as we think about the next 20 or 30 years, uh, you've got uh, all of these new technologies. Think about electric vehicles, right? Think about uh, sustainable building materials. We should own the technology. We should own the manufacturing. We should own the supply chain, not allow China or India or other countries to dominate these industries. And in 20, 30 years time, I wanna be able to say that the technologies that we all use, they were developed, manufactured, innovated right here in the United States of America. If we fail to do that, we're still going to be using these technologies. They're just gonna be developed elsewhere, China or India or elsewhere. And I think that would be a massive mistake, a massive mistake. So I'm all in on things like the supply chain for electric vehicles, for example, building them here with good jobs that pay good wages, uh, not just buying cars that are you know, manufactured in China or, or elsewhere uh, as one of many examples. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do. I think we can do it. Uh, we're gonna need, I think, um, to turn the temperature down on the politics and get to the science again. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. I uh, just want to go off the environment topic for, for a question, but it's an important question, things that's on people's minds is talking about uh, gerrymandering and voting rights. Now, uh, we've seen the, the Supreme Court, I don't know if they're through murdering the Voting Rights Act, but uh, you know, it, it's in the process of being assassinated. There's really no doubt about that. And uh, you look at, I forget the uh, election, but in, in statewide election in, in Ohio, Democrats got very close to 50% of the vote and ended up with four out of 16 congressional seats. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we know that uh, Democrats had like, I think two or three congressional seats out of 16. They redistricted, uh, the court forced them to redistrict in a different way and they ended up splitting the seats eight and eight. In North Carolina, it was the same thing as Ohio, 13 districts, 50% of the vote for Democrats, three congressional seats. HR1 seems to be the only vehicle that's available right now to uh, to address these issues. But is there any way HR1 or something that would address these issues? Is there any path for that short of the Senate removing the filibuster? Is there do you see any path for that to to, to take to take hold? Well, that is the path. Uh, I had a long chat with John Sarbanes, Congressman from Maryland, who wrote HR1. Uh, I want to say now I've spoke with him at length about three, four weeks ago. And I asked him the same question, Alan, you know, is there a path here other than eliminating the filibuster? And, you know, what I would like to see President Biden do is get uh, Joe Manchin and let's say Lisa Murkowski or Susan Collins, one of the Republicans, get them in a room and tell them to work out a bipartisan deal on voting rights, uh, maybe akin to the proposal that Manchin offered uh, before the, the Senate voted uh, and, and they voted not even to allow debate. It wasn't that they voted against HR1. They, they voted not even to allow debate on HR1. It was pathetic. It is pathetic. But anyway, I would like to see uh, Manchin and uh, uh, one of the Republicans come together with a bipartisan proposal. And then I'd like to see if the Senate, uh, when the Senate votes that down, if they vote that down or if it doesn't get the 60 votes necessary, at that point, maybe that will wake up Joe Manchin. Uh, we'll wake up uh, Kirsten Cinema. 
Uh, I was encouraged just this morning that my friend, uh, the majority whip of the House, Jim Clyburn, uh, is now uh, openly advocating for President Biden uh, to uh, uh, signal uh, that the filibuster should be, if not eliminated entirely, should be, um, uh, there should be an exception, a carve out for voting rights. Um, I would encourage everybody to watch the movie All In. Uh, it's, uh, you, can, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, I'm not promoting Amazon, just to be clear. But that movie is uh, Stacey Abrams' uh, a movie. And about half of it is about Stacey Abrams and her life, which is just remarkable. And then the other half is voting rights and, and her path to, to try to protect voting rights. One of the things that the movie really hammers home that I didn't fully appreciate, but makes perfect sense. John Roberts, we think of Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice Roberts as being a, a reasonable person. Um, on voting rights, he's terrible. On voting rights, he, he clerked for William Rehnquist. Uh, you know, he, he has been a consistent opponent uh, of voting rights. Uh, just the same, uh, Brett Kavanaugh has a long history of uh, being really, really bad uh, on, uh, on voting rights. And don't even get me started on Thomas or Alito or Barrett. Um, so uh, we're sort of stuck with these folks uh, who are now a consistent 6-3 block against voting rights. We saw that um, you know the Shelby versus Holder decision was a 5-4 decision. These two most recent decisions were 6-3 decisions. Uh, the only way we're going to uh, push back against that Supreme Court precedent now is with legislation. And that's where HR1 became, becomes even more important uh, or a compromised version of HR1 becomes even more important. The most significant provisions of HR1 uh, that we have to get across the finish line are the independent redistricting commissions and the campaign finance provisions. Uh, if we get just those two things, now all the other voting provisions are all very important as well, but I'd like to see those two things actually uh, come to fruition. That would be so, so powerful. Um, the other thing I'll mention is we are going to advance the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act uh, in the House. That'll be coming as well, but that should not be a substitute for HR 1. It is a supplement. Uh, that deals specifically with the idea of preclearance, which is the concept that states ought to, uh, uh, there ought to be a check on states trying to diminish voting rights. And that'll go head-to-head uh, -head with, uh, with the, con with the uh, Supreme Court just decided uh, was uh, the intent of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So we'll have to, you know, to, to pass the John Lewis bill uh, to, to make it very clear uh, where Congress stands with regard to voting rights. So a lot more will happen. Uh, my big concern is that it will not happen in time for the 2022 election, because Alan, as you correctly point out, a lot of those states are already uh, being dramatically gerrymandered by Republican legislatures. Right. Uh just a, a quick addition to that question. Is it possible, because uh, HR 1 contains a uh, uh, setup of citizens commissions to do re redistrict, if there's money in that bill to fund these commissions, could it possibly go through reconciliation or is that too much of a stretch? Not that you're um, parliamentarian. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we ought to try. And, and I've brought that up. We ought to see which provisions would, would uh, be considered within order uh, for reconciliation. And I think Chuck Schumer has heard that message from our caucus loud and clear. Okay. All right. And I, we're running kind of late on time. So this might might be the last question. I'm not sure. But I want to ask you about uh, the desalinization plant they're thinking of building down in Huntington Beach. Uh, uh, you know, I know Israel use, gets almost all of its water from desalinization. And I know also that Australia built, I think, five, maybe it's three desalinization plants. And realize that they couldn't use them because they're too expensive to use. Uh, so what do you think about the whole process? And do you think Huntington Beach is an appropriate place for it? Well, what I know is that we have the largest desal plant in the Western Hemisphere in my district, uh, the Bud Lewis plant in Carlsbad. And they're expanding it from 50 million gallons a day to 60 million gallons a day. Uh, I also uh, have been to Israel to those desal plants there. There's actually a great book uh, people really want to dig into it called Let There Be Water uh, about Israel's transition. Now, Israel has unique geographic limitations, and they've had to rely 
on recycling and on desalination for a lot of their supply. I think they recycle something unbelievable, like 85, 90% of their water. So truly incredible. Um, there are also great recycling projects going on in Orange County. You probably know about uh, the Fountain Valley uh, project. Uh, they, uh, we can't call, call it toilet to tap. They don't like that. Call it showers to flowers. That's the uh, correct uh, verbiage. Uh, but uh, I know the uh, Poseidon project has uh, uh, been uh, something that they, they have considered and, and gone back and forth uh, seemingly for as long as I can remember. It's been 20 or 30 years now. Uh, and I would never get in the, the front of the, the residents of Huntington Beach to determine uh, what's best for uh, their community if they want uh, that facility. What I can tell you is that uh, technology has improved significantly. Um, the uh, ability to have lower emissions power generation on site, you know, to utilize renewables, uh, perhaps solar with batteries, for example, to generate the electricity. Uh, so you don't have the criteria of pollutant emissions when you do uh, generators, you know, uh, burning off NOx and particulate matter. That's that's good. And then the second uh, important environmental concern is uh, the uh, impact on marine life. Um, we don't really have a definitive answer of wide scale. If you do wide scale desal, what is the impact on um, a lower salinity uh, ocean? Um, we don't know the answer to that. There are a lot of really good studies out there. Uh, some of the leaders on it are the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is at the very southern tip of my district uh, in La Jolla. Uh, and their best scientists believe uh, that so long as you don't solely rely on desalination, so long as it is part of a portfolio uh, of things like recycling and, and otherwise, then it's, it's probably all right. Uh, I know that the technology has improved dramatically with regard to um, the way they uh, uh, are able to do the slant well drilling, as they call it. They're looking at doing one here uh, where I live uh, in uh, off Doheny Beach, right down the street from, from my house. Um, and so I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, I do think that to the extent that we fund any of these projects, they have to use environmental best practices. Uh, I also know that California in the years ahead and the decades ahead are gonna have, we're gonna have real trouble with water. Uh, we have decimated our groundwater in the Central Valley, um, you know, and it's only going to get uh, more difficult, not easier, um, you know, in, in the decades ahead. And so we're going to need a diverse portfolio of solutions to be able to address the water challenges that we're gonna face. Thank you very much. So that, that, is, that is the time we have, that was the last question we have time for. Uh, so I well, want to apologize. Yeah. Let me just say thank you. This thank was you. fantastic. And uh, I hope that um, we can meet up in person very soon. Mm -hmm. If you are interested in volunteering, Adam, do you want to spend uh, one minute and talk about how people can volunteer? Oh, Adam is muted. There, now he's unmuted. There you go. How about now? <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. Uh, you know, want to also thank everybody. Really appreciate you having us today. And as Mike said, you know, this is going to look, we think, like 2018 more so than, than last year. So if anybody's interested in making phone calls, knocking on doors, uh, any kind of help, we, we would love to have you. Uh, I'll put uh, my email in the uh, chat and you can just send me an email and, and let us know. Thank you very much. And, and thank you. Thank you, Congressman Levin. Really appreciate you being here. And Adam, we really appreciate you very, I, very much. And I apologize to people's questions. There were good questions on the chat. Some people submitted questions beforehand. They were all good questions. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to them, but uh, you know, we have our time. Well, yeah, everybody can also always email us. Uh, Adam yeah. is going to use email. And uh, if there are questions that you have, I'll be happy to uh, try to get to them uh, by email. Thank you very much. And Levin and Adam for all of us here and for Sue during our president who couldn't be here with us today, but I'm sure she's gonna be watching this video again and again and again. She finally had a chance to meet with her children and grandchildren after a year and a half. And for myself, Rebecca Gilad, vice president of the club, 
I thank you very, very much. You'll be hearing from us a lot. Fantastic. I look forward to that. And I'm so glad everyone is doing well and staying healthy and safe and vaccinated. And go have a fantastic weekend because it's going to be a beautiful weekend. Do our best, we promise. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.